Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Can you hear me okay in the back? Great. I'm Danny Lichtenfeld, director of the Brattleboro Museum and Arts Center. I'm so delighted you're all here. I want to extend a special welcome to those of you who are here from out of town, including many friends and family of wolves, and also to those of you who may be visiting for the first time, welcome. The title of tonight's talk is Planning and Spontaneity in Art, and the subtext might have been called Planning and Spontaneity in Scheduling a Lecture, <laughs> because it was only a few weeks ago that these plans came together for tonight's event, and we were a little nervous about being able to get word out in time but it appears our concerns were unfounded. So glad that worked out and so happy to see you all here. In fact, if we had done a better job of getting word out, I'm not sure where we would have put anyone else. Before I introduce Wolf Kahn, who I realize for many of you needs no introduction, it's my pleasure to invite Ellen McCulloch Lovell, president of Marlboro College, up to the stage to say a few words. Marlboro College has sponsored tonight's event. And there are wonderful partners in all sorts of projects, including the sculpture garden between our building and the graduate school, uh, a major exhibit that we mounted a year ago featuring the college's art faculty. Uh, the museum and the college also share Wolf in a sense, in that Wolf is a trustee of Marlboro College and an honorary trustee of the museum. So would you please welcome Ellen McCulloch Lovell. Thank you so much, Danny. I simply want to greet Wolf and all of you for being here tonight. I've been thinking recently, Wolf, especially um, given your recent birthday, about um, the lastingness of Wolf Kahn. And um, so it drove me back to some reading about creativity that I've been doing, uh, especially the psychologist Mahai Csikszentmihalyi. And um, Csikszentmihalyi says that creative people have two main characteristics. One is, one he calls boundless curiosity, and the other is relentless drive. And I think both of those characterize Wolf. Fortunately, that curiosity and that drive extends to Wolf and Emily's um, support of cultural and educational institutions. We're so lucky, Wolf, to have you as a neighbor, a friend, um, and someone who understands that institutions are needed to support artists and to educate young people to love the arts, which should be an essential part of their lives. Marlboro College is very pleased and very proud to sponsor this evening with Wolf Kahn and to support the Brattleboro Museum and Art Center. Thank you. At the end of tonight's talk, I, I believe Wolf will take a few questions, if you have any, and then he's going to make his way up to the table behind me here, where he'll sign books and, and posters and cards and so on. Uh, the, the talk tonight is being filmed by Andy Reichsman, and I believe a DVD will be available in a few weeks, and that you can place an order for that tonight, if you wish, perhaps to share with someone who couldn't make it tonight. We also have DVDs of the three previous lectures Wolf has given here at the museum. And if you're interested, I'm pretty sure we'll give you a deal on a four disc box set. <laughs> 40 years ago last month, this museum put up its first exhibit ever, which prominently and proudly featured a painting by Wolf Kahn right there on that wall. It also featured work by David Rohn, who's here tonight. Wolf has been a great friend of the museum ever since. And it's truly an honor four decades later to have him speak here, sharing his insights gained over a long and remarkably productive lifetime in art. Wolf is regarded as one of the most prominent, one of the most important painters working in America today. Born in Germany, he emigrated to the United States by way of England in 1940. After graduating from the High School of Music and Art in New York City, he spent time in the Navy. Under the GI Bill, he studied with the well-known teacher and abstract expressionist Hans Hoffman, 
eventually becoming Hoffman's studio assistant. After receiving his baccalaureate degree from the University of Chicago in just one year, Wolf joined with other former Hoffman students to establish the Hansa, a cooperative gallery where he had his first one-man show. He's received a Fulbright scholarship, a Guggenheim fellowship, and an award in art from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. He's a member of the National Academy of Design as well as the Academy of Arts and Letters. Wolf has created paintings all around the world, but in the summer and fall, he's to be found here in West Brattleboro, where he and his wife Emily Mason have lived on their farm since 1968. Wolf regularly exhibits at galleries and museums across North America, and his work is held in the collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Whitney Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Hirshhorn Museum, the Los Angeles County Museum, just to name a few. Wolf turned 85 earlier this week, and we waited until after his birthday to have him talk so that he would have that much more wisdom to impart tonight. So would you please welcome Wolf Kahn. my notes, voluminous though they are. <laughs> All the wisdom of the world is on, on, this piece of, <coughs> on this piece of paper. Well, uh, <coughs> I must apologize, first of all, for um, being so old. <laughs> because what happens to you when you're old is First of all, you need to have Abel here, you know, brother to Cain. And, um, and you have to have uh, a lot more notes. I didn't, never used to have notes, but I noticed that even um, great pianists, now uh, they reach a certain age and they, they have music on, on, on their, their mu music stands where they used to be able to, to, to play everything by heart. Like Richard Good, for the first time, he's doing um, the three uh, last Beethoven sonatas, which I think he must have played at least 50 times. But now he doesn't trust himself anymore. He puts up these notes, you know. So um, I, ha I have this here. And every now and then, you will have to excuse me because I have to use this. <laughs> because I don't have very good eyesight. However, I have good enough eyesight to continue my work, which, you know, everybody keeps asking me, are you still painting? <laughs> you know? and, and my stock answer is, I don't know how to do anything else. <laughs> so I'm still painting. But uh, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, who lived in this area, uh, every summer, um, he said he got very upset when people asked him, are you still writing? Are you still doing this? Are you still doing that? And they're so amazed that he's still doing all of these things because he's not supposed to. He's supposed to be out playing golf. Well, I don't know how to play golf. I used to be a, um, I used to be a caddy when I was uh, in a country club in New Jersey near, near Montclair. And the people, when they play golf, they behave so badly. You know, they get so upset. They get upset with each other, and they certainly get upset at the caddy, because, you know, if you can't find that damn little ball, you know, uh, they look at you with daggers in their eyes, you know, and they wish they had another caddy, and they won't give you a tip, things like that. So um, I decided it's not my sport at all. Um, like, for a while, my sport was tennis. But when you don't have good eyesight, that's not a good sport to have because you can see the ball when, it, when the opponent throws it up in the air. The next time you see it is when it's at your feet. <laughs> and in between, it's uh, traveling so fast that you can't see it anymore. So I had to reluctantly give up tennis. 
which is probably very good because tennis used to give me an, a reg, regular f sense of uh, incompetence, <laughs> <laughs> which one doesn't need. No, but what one does need to give, you courage, give one courage and make one feel good is a full house. And what we have here is a full house. <laughs> So I thank you all for allowing my normal sense of conceit and arrogance to continue. <laughs> now what I'm talking about tonight is um, planning and spontaneity, mostly in painting, although I start out from other disciplines. Um, I read a preface by Henry James, and I just asked uh, an English professor, what's it, what's it the press, preface to? And he didn't know either. So I don't feel quite as ignorant as I, as I, as, as I did before. So, um, but it's a preface by Henry James where he says all he has to do is to have in mind a character. He doesn't have any idea of the plot. But once he has a, uh, in mind a character, the plot develops by itself from what this character would be expected to do. And of course, um, if you're a, um, a very, very great genius as Henry James was, your character starts right, right away to be a complicated uh, kind of person. And, uh, and you have a much easier way of, of, of developing a plot because complicated people do complicated things. Another person who also does spontaneous things. Um, how many people here have read a book called The Poetics of Music by Stravinsky? Nobody. <laughs> Ignorant audience. <laughs> anyway, this is a wonderful book. And it, uh, it, it, it should be read by everyone. This, this was a set, I think, of, of lectures he gave at Harvard. And uh, uh, he's asked, or he asks himself, what do, you, what do I need to inspire me? Because people normally think that an artist, you know, he has an inspiration and then he carries it out. So Stravinsky said, all he needs to do to inspire himself is to sharpen his pencil and, that's, and, and put out his music sheets. Then he sits down at the piano and starts playing around on the piano. And every now and then, a, a musical idea occurs to him, you know, coming out of God knows where. But there it is, it's a musical idea, and that allows him to proceed. Um, there's a wonderful painter named um, Robert Motherwell who died, you know, just a few years ago. And he was asked, um, how do you know when your painting's finished? So he said, well, my painting proceeds by a series of mistakes. <laughs> and as soon as I come upon a mistake which I can't correct, the painting's finished. <laughs> So, so there's all kinds of, all kinds of uh, things like that that inspire you and allow you to be sloppy in your thinking, you know? And I think most artists aren't very clear thinkers. They're sloppy thinkers. And uh, the work they do is kind of sloppy work. You get dirty hands, you know, you, you, um, you, 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 you're somewhere halfway between being a workman and, and being an intellectual. Uh, and uh, this, um, uh, the Germans call, call such people Luftmenschen, which means people who live on air. And artists are generally Luftmenschen because there's no, no, no real reason for anybody to wish to become an artist except the fact that some some curious drive gets them there and gets them past that awful moment after art school when nobody but nobody cares about you. you know? 
and people, if they buy a picture of yours, it's usually from your own family. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and they even even as in the act of doing that, they feel like they're doing an act of charity. <laughs> and uh, here I am. I'm I'm beyond being the recipient of, of charitable acts, and I'm terribly pleased about that. You know? <laughs> um, actually, I've sold pictures to people whose names I don't even know, you know? And, and my family, uh, most of them aren't around anymore, except in the new, the new generation, who, who, who of uh, my grandson, my granddaughter, and my daughter, they're all here, and I'm terribly, pleased to have them here because I have a feeling even though they might not be able to follow everything that I talk about, they see that they have an extraordinarily important grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so why why do I disdain um, planning? Well, I mean, I, I see all these, these other people disdain planning too. But I grew up as a product of abstract expressionism. Now, most of you don't even know what abstract expressionism stands for. But I'll tell you, it's really the next step after surrealism. And what is surrealism? Surrealism believes that there's such a thing as the unconscious and that the artist brings out from these dim regions uh, something that makes the unconscious visible, makes it manifest, and thereby um, uh, becomes a, a, a kind of explainer of the psyche. Well, I think, I think that's a wonderful idea, although I never expect to explain my psyche by doing my work, you know. I have, um, I have three mottos, one of which is, I just work here, you know. I try not to, I try not to have any uh, uh, exaggerated ideas of, of what I'm about, make small claims, because it behooves me. I mean, I'm, I'm just a soldier in the ranks. I'm, the fact that I've been living long enough and I'm, I'm a noisy enough person and have all those books and things like that, get exhibition in the Brattleboro Museum. So now my fame has spread as far as Guilford. <laughs> um, but to, uh, to be serious again, um, the relation between surrealism and abstract expressionism is through the act of painting. The act of painting allows you to be, to be very um, indirect at the same time that you're doing something very direct. It's an indirect mode of arriving at the subconscious. Because, you know, when you're making a move as a painter, what guides you? What, 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 what's, what's at in, in back of that, you don't know. You know, you just you just hope that it's going to carry you carry you further. Um, and you know, one of the things that I want to have happen in in this in 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 this uh, um, hope is uh, that I, I gain great greater freedom. The word the word freedom is 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 very important in in all painting but especially important in abstract expressionism because um, uh, you, uh, it, by, by being um, free, so to speak, you make a, a du direct um, um, uh, detour of, uh, to the mind. Um, my wife, who's, who's an uh, artist herself, and, and she's not well tonight, so she's not here, but she always says to her class, when she teaches, she says, get the mind out of the way. Get the mind out of the way. And um, of course, 
to be to 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 be very unintelligent to begin with helps a lot. You know, because you don't you don't have to do an awful lot of a lot of shifting of furniture in that in, uh, if, if if this is what, what what your idea is. So anyway, um, and you get the mind out of the way in order to have things happen that that are unexpected. Because if you constantly do things that that you know about, then you're not an artist, you're a performer. And I think I think there's a distinct difference between an artist and a performer. Um, and and uh, the more able you are to circumvent the conscious mind, uh, the better off you are. And, and one of the modes to do that is through color. Because what do we know about color? Nothing. Nobody ever thinks about color. They think, does it look nice? Does it, uh, d does it go with my uh, necktie and the shirt, you know? Um, uh, or, 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 or scarf or something like that, you know? And you just think about colors as going together or clashing. I think it's more difficult to find colors that clash than to find colors that go together, actually, you know? Because in order to, to be responsive to, to clashing figures, uh, colors, you already have to have some kind of idea of harmonious color, you know? And of course, harmonious color can very easily turn into conventional color. Whenever you get a catalog, uh, let's say from, um, uh, what's that horrible store in Maine? Um, uh, huh? L.L. Bean, thank you. Yes, I say it's a horrible store because every time we go north, Emily stops there. <laughs> and emerges with all sorts of junk that, that we don't need, you know, but that she feels has a special glamour because it comes from L.L. Bean. But anyway, um, um, the thing is that uh, we all are bound by conventions and, and, and very much by habit. And as artists, both of these are our, 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 our enemies because you're not supposed to think conventionally and you're not supposed to be doing what you've already done before because what you've done before if you do it again, it becomes performance. You know? um, I gave a lecture at, Mar at um, the Marlboro Music Festival two years ago, and um, it was called The Relation Between uh, uh, Painting and Music. So at one point I said, uh, I said, even an experienced per a soloist has to have in his way of looking at the piece he's playing a sense of amateurism, you know, that's, that he hasn't quite gotten it yet, you know, in order to have a feeling that he's playing it fresh, that it's not something that, that's a performance, because both as a painter and as a musician, you're not allowed to have just a performance. So, um, there's a very, very fine lady there named, um, 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 what's the best flutist's name uh, in, in America? Um, gosh, Paula, Paula, huh? Paula Robinson, thank you so much. Um, Paula Robinson, and she said, when I was finished saying about talking about performance, she says, say that again. So I said it again. And I said, yes, it's very important to keep, to keep a sense that you're still an amateur in a certain way. So um, David Sawyer, he, he, he pipes up. And he's a very severe person. He died recently, but he's, you know, he, even, uh, even at my lecture, he disagreed, and he said, 
He says, I hate amateurs. So I said, oh, come on, David. Every note that comes out of your instrument has a slight note of uncertainty to it. And all the students that worked with him that were under his thumb, because he's a very severe uh, senior member there, they all laughed and clapped and applauded, you know. <laughs> but I, uh, I, think, I think it's, the, the, what I'm trying to say is it's good not to know everything, not to know, quite know what you're doing. Um, to, to be too certain and, and, and too, too glib about your work, I think isn't good for you, you know, even though the public loves it. You know, the public is usually wrong. One has to, huh? The uh, public has a tendency to, to, to like what they've seen before. And uh, like for example, like I used to be known as a painter of barns. You know, and um, uh, so I have de dealers come, come, come into my studio and say, you got any barns? <laughs> <laughs> so um, being a noble and moral person, I immediately stopped painting barns. <laughs> but now that I no longer feel so noble and feel slightly immoral, I uh, have gone back to painting barns because who's going to tell me what to do? Every now and then, every now and then you see a barn and you just, you know, it, by its position or by its uh, um, uh, color or its size in the landscape, it, it looks wonderful. In fact, barns in general always look better than the farmer's dwellings, you know. Uh, so, so the farmer's dwellings to be painted, uh, there's only one, one painter around here who did that well, it's Eric Aho. He knows how to paint dwellings that, uh, you know, that have white paint on them, surrounded by trees. And, um, but n most people don't know how to do that. But everybody in New England feels the necessity to paint barns. So, um, good reason not to paint one. You know. um, let's see. Now, um, I, uh, I should talk a little bit about what, what I myself do and get away from generalities and talk about specifics. Because like uh, one thing about art is it's the celebration of particulars, I think, you know. I used, to, I used to try to define what is art. And one definition I came up with is um, anything that you feel strongly about or strongly enough about to wish to uh, make a work of it is, is going to result in art. And then uh, somebody told me, well, what about pornography? You know, people feel very strongly about it, but it doesn't usually result in high art. So I said, well, that's the, 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 the fault of our culture because pornography can very easily be art. And, and uh, the fact that most of the time it isn't is because nobody's doing it well enough. You know, not making it dirty enough to, to, to get people really interested. You know, they're still in the realm of the conventional. And, and uh, uh, as such, they can't be classed uh, as real artists. So I'm looking for a good pornographer. Anybody, <laughs> anybody around here who, who thinks they can do it real well, please raise their hand. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's, how do I start? How do I begin? Well, Miro had a wonderful way of doing, doing for himself. He laid the canvas on, on the ground of his studio and then splashed uh, paint with a lot of turpentine over it. And the way the drops and, and, and puddles 
form gave him the idea of, of what the composition, so-called, would end up having to be. Now, I don't have anything quite as good as that, but I do start, I, I usually start with the idea of trying to do something that I've done before, but do it more outrageously. So, for example, I've, I used to um, spend a lot of time in, in um, Southampton, uh, Long Island, you know, which is the enclave of the rich. And, um, and every, every, every house there is surrounded by hedges. And the hedges are just high enough that you can't see what's going on behind them, privet hedges, you know. So that gives the whole, whole place a, a, a sense of, of mystery and privacy. So I used to try and paint, paint those hedges and uh, never got, got a really good result until I finally decided this summer that those hedges should be dark purple. So I made them all dark purple and now I'm, I'm home free. I'm making good hedges. <laughs> so so you, 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 you start trying to go a little further than you've gone before because there's a wonderful word that uh, should apply to all, all art called transcendence, which means going beyond. And I think art, artists, you know, should be the carriers of transcendence, ideally. Um, do, do things that people haven't seen before or, 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 or heard before or read before. Um, there's a wonderful saying by André Gide, French writer in his, in his um, um, memoirs, where he said that when he was 18, he set himself a task, which is to write every day a sentence that's never been written or, or read before. You know? And that, 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 that's a terrific idea, you know, because most of the time what we do is rehash to do again what, what, what we know well. And um, I'm sure somewhere in the world there's somebody standing at a lectern telling you exactly the same thing. I mean, telling the world exactly the same thing that I'm now telling you, because there's so many of us. And, and there's so few ideas, you know? And, and uh, I have even fewer than the average, because I really don't like ideas, you know? I, 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 I like activity, I like process, you know. And every, every, anybody who's in, in, involved in process, which means to, to, to work by, by addition, by augmentation, and, and anybody who's involved in process, all you have to do is just look at your painting and it'll tell you what the next move you should be making. The painting is actually your guide. The painting allows you to, to, to move forward not any idea that you have, although of course there are painters who, who, who paint ideas like Michelangelo, he had the idea of, of painting God, you know, uh, touching, touching the finger of, 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 um, of Adam. Well, nowadays, of course, we don't believe in Adam and we don't even believe in God, most of us. So how could we possibly paint, paint that, that kind of a painting, that, that kind of idea? But re religious ideas were so, um, were so uh, prevalent in those days that everybody, uh, and the church also was a, um, 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 a catalyst in, in, in allowing these, these things to happen, so that everybody became a religious painter. And it's the people who were genuinely religious who made the best paintings, really. There's a painter named Fra Angelico, um, who uh, was active in Florence in the Renaissance. And he used to, um, if he painted a crucifixion, he'd sit in front of it and cry, his own painting. Yeah. That's, that's very admirable, but I, I couldn't do it. I, I cry when the painting's finished and I see how unsatisfactory it is. <laughs> you know? But that's not the same as uh, wishing to make a painting ad maiorem de, de gloria, uh, to the greater glory of God. But we don't have these things available. 
but we do still have available our medium paint and um, color and um, and the public to go against you know but to go to 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 do what the public wants is 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 almost sure to make you be a failed failed artist public the public is has been historically especially in the last 200 years on the wrong side and everybody now wants to avoid getting on that same side and the the curators in every museum except the Brattleboro Museum they all they all think that they're going to adva advance their cause by uh, being in favor of the latest thing so that now uh, traditional artists, if, if they have any, a good sense of what they're doing, have the feel to themselves. I mean, I feel I'm, I'm not competing with Jeff Koons. You know, he's somewhere else. He's, he's, he's in another garden planting his flowers, which don't turn out to be very terrific flowers to begin with. But, um, but it allow, allows me sort of free hand because I have a feeling I'm doing something that needs to be done and uh, needs to be done well so that people feel that I'm carrying forward something that goes way into the past, all the way to the, to the 1300s, you know, when people first had the idea that the main thing in, in, in art was to make something that makes sense, you know, as a as a surface, as a set of relations. And, and to, to get to that point where things make sense as a surface, um, you already have to have quite a bit of practice. For example, I had an, an, another instance, I was painting the woods. You know, all these verticals you have in the woods, you know, and I was painting that. And in the process, I became so over the surface became so overworked that it no longer felt like the woods because you couldn't penetrate it totally impenetrable so i had the brilliant idea of t taking the painting and putting it at 90 degrees and it became the ocean you know because i had all these all these things that are going this way at 90 degrees everything goes that way and of course the ocean doesn't have to be penetrable it can be as a uh, uh, impenetrable surface. So that taught me that the main thing that an artist does is he, he creates certain kinds of surfaces. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the, the thing then to is, is to um, um, I wish I could write my own writing, read my own writing. Wait a minute. Uh, the main, main, main thing is to, to know what you're good at and go against it. Because if, if you depend entirely on what you're good at, you're going to repeat yourself over and over again. Which doesn't mean that necessarily you have to pick on everything that you're not good at because that, that's, of course, going in the wrong direction, too. The thing is that the world is so full of phenomena. There's, there's up, there's down, there's sideways, there's space behind you, there's space in front of you. All of, all of these things can be expressed through paint. And um, things are either crowded or they're open, they're translucent or they're dense. All of this can be expressed through the work that you're doing. And if you do it well, the world actually appreciates it. And 250 people come and listen to you talk about it. So I'm very pleased to have you all here. And I hope that now I get some good questions, possibly some impertinent ones, because they bring out the best in me. Uh, and uh, don't, don't, don't be afraid to ask anything that you, you want to.
because we've got we've got how much more time do we have, Andy? How much time is it? Well, Until then let's. Start leaving. Huh? Until people start leaving. Until people start leaving. Yeah. I don't want to wait that long. <laughs> uh, so please, uh, can I uh, let, let me say that the formal part of the lecture is is over, and now um, we're gonna have a participatory democracy. Wolf, did you want to, do you want to take the questions? And I'll, I'll repeat them. So that okay. Uh, the question is how long have you been painting? Um, let me see. Uh, Eighty years. I started. I started working as a kid, very early, very early, because I have read since then. I've read from Dostoevsky, who said uh, that only five percent of the people in the world are ever able to fulfill the dreams of their youth. So I decided I'd go, I'd go start real early with the dreams of my youth so that uh, I'd be one of those 5%. So I started at the age of five by, by drawing and painting. And I was encouraged by my grandma, with whom I was living, um, who gave me lots of art materials. And uh, when she had her bridge evenings, um, she would invite me to come uh, in, in front of the ladies and show, show them my latest work and then I'd get a piece of cake. <laughs> does that answer your question? Yes, it does. At great, at great length. Wolf, you spoke of, uh, of the unconscious as a guide to your work. And um, people were in psychoanalysis for years and years to try to bring what's in the unconscious into the conscious. How do you perceive? How do you open your, yourself up? I mean, this is not easy. Well, I tell you, the, um, I have, I have a, a, a ready-made procedure. It's my work. You know, I'm, I think people who, who, who are writers, like, like Henry James in this instance, who doesn't know which way his, his characters are going when he begins, but I'm sure when he's finished with this, with, with this character, he knows more about himself too, and about what's going on in, in the uh, lower regions of, of his consciousness. You know, I mean, uh, one thing about artists is they, they, do, they do believe that to, to live on the surface all the time isn't the right way to go. So it's, it's a ready-made process to be a painter means that, that a certain part of your unconscious is, is, is constantly uh, you know, coming to the surface. How do you open the door? Huh? How do you open that door? To, to the unconscious? I don't know, you, you sharpen your pencil and put out your music uh, sheet, you know. It's through your work, through the discipline of your work. You know, un un unless your work does that for you, you're not doing it right. Yes? I think you said that one of the best ways to bring out the unconscious is through color, because one we know about color or nothing. And yet, your color is so supremely beautiful. I think you could tell us something about how it's <laughs> Could you hear it back here? Question. This person is questioning whether Wolf really doesn't have something to teach us about color and whether he perhaps doesn't know a little bit about more about color than he's letting on. Well, as soon as I'm able to generalize about a color or a set of relations of color, I no longer believe it. You know, because because um, you're not supposed to know what you're doing. You know, you're, you're supposed to have, have things happen spontaneously. That's why my lecture is called 
planning and spontaneity. And if you plan all this stuff, I mean, planning in my book is, is like a bad thing. It's like trying to be beautiful. You know, if I try to make a beautiful painting, it's bound to fail. Because uh, what do I know about beauty that, that I didn't know before? Uh, that 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 uh, I I can use. It's all it's all uh, conventionality. You know, we all know what a beautiful woman looks like. You know, but every now and then somebody comes along who surprises us. You know, who doesn't look like Marilyn Monroe, and 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 that's always a a, a more satisfying moment than than to see another cover girl. Or, or these models that they have, you know. Although I like models, you know. Okay. <laughs> uh, the question is: uh, Is there is superficial thinking really a, a problem? Why? Why? What's wrong with superficial thinking, which seems to be on, on the rise? In, over the past however many years, what's the problem with superficial thinking being the basis for doing your work, for, for art? The kid's nodding, so that's going to that's gonna have to... A good question, actually. I mean, what's wrong with superficial thinking? That's more or less what you're saying, right? Um, well, I, I don't want to... Um, um, be bad-tempered and talk about my, my feelings about the moment in history and the moment in art. But it's not, not a glorious moment, certainly not, not in politics, it's not a glorious moment. Um, we're all sort of, sort of caught in these slogans and these, these, these attitudes that are so well known that they become terribly uninteresting. Uh, but. I agree with you. I think there's more superficial thinking now, and it's more um, uh, allowed all around than it used to be. I think the media are, are responsible. I hate the media. I have a theory. I have a theory that as you get older, um, you know, you, you become much more aware of the things that are wrong around you in order to be prepared for death. So that, so that when you die, you feel, well, oh, that's good, goodbye. <laughs> it's only halfway funny. <laughs> I just work here. And the other one, the other two, well, one of them is uh, follow the brush. And by that I mean let things happen. Like, for example, that uh, what Paul Clay, who's a wonderful painter from the early 20th century, he said that the artist, the kind of person who takes advantage of accidents. Mm -hmm. And of course, you've got to, there again, if, if you've got too many plans, not, there's not going to be any accidents. You know, you know exactly what you have to do, and you do it. But I, I, I believe in accidents, and the main thing to do in, in those cases is to be very alert. Alertness is terribly important in art. You've got to be, be, be very um, um, focused and alert in order to have anything good happen. And I'm still focused and alert, although much less so than I used to be. So there's, I just work here. There's oh yeah, the brush. Brush. oh yeah, and the last one is the most difficult. I don't give a shit. <laughs> Excuse me, children. <laughs> which means, which means, don't take everything so goddamn seriously, you know? You, after all, you're, in a certain way, what you're doing is what baseball players do, which is to do something that kids do naturally, except you do it 
and get paid for it, you know, which is kind of nice. You know, but it doesn't mean that it's any different from what kids do when they do children's art. You know. And the thing about uh, 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 children's art that's very inspiring is it doesn't have to have any thought in it at all. You know, they, the children like the idea of, of just being, um, just moving the thing around and make, making marks on, on, on their surfaces. And if you manage to keep that playful spirit going as an artist, it's very useful. Mm -hmm. So by saying, I don't give, uh, give a damn, you know, uh, so what? You, it means that you're not going to lose your, your playful spirit, you know. Very important to keep that going. Yes? Do you think that the current dominant culture, the consumer-wired culture, is counterproductive to the very creative process we've been talking about this evening? I think it could be a, a, a spur. You know, it could be something that makes you feel all the more how important your, your activity is. You know, that you're not just uh, 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 ma making uh, expensive items for rich people, but you're doing, you're doing something that helps, helps the general culture. Gives, let's say in my case, my work gives pe people with a conservative bent gives them a feeling that not everything is lost, you know. Anyone else? Yeah. In, in the back over here, and then... You speak a lot about um, uh, spontaneity. Do you feel that planning is the enemy of our artistic vision? Oh, no. It's not, it's not a, 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 uh, a battleground between planning and spontaneity. I just think that, in, especially in the mind of people who don't uh, think about art from one end of the week to the other, um, it's good for them to know that, that ideas don't mean very much in art. You know, that you, um, like, it's better to have a playful spirit and, 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 and a certain, and to be aiming for a certain amount of freedom as you're working, you know, of, of, of freedom of action. You know, for example, one reason I don't paint nudes, although I love nudes, uh, um, is because uh, as a landscape painter, you put another branch in a place where they need it, uh, branches need it. You know. <laughs> Whereas, if you have to put a third leg on a nude, you've done something horrible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so it, it just allows you more freedom. I think landscape painting allows you a lot of freedom. Although I'm at the stage now where I want to be a landscape painter who doesn't describe anything, which is, you know, kind of difficult. Because I don't believe in description either. I mean, I'm not, trying, I'm not trying to paint the woods. I just use the idea of the woods as something that gets me going and gives me a, a sense of freedom. Didi, did you have a question? Um, um, I wanted to see if maybe you could uh, help me out with my with writing question. Because you mentioned Henry James, his favorite portrait of a lady I've read many, many times. And I always find something new with this, but I try to uh, ask a question that to paraphrase Anthony Lane in a recent critique, um, where he said that plenty of writers have written about the, the old world customer, you know, but why did Henry James, you know, make it so different? And it's still so timely and resonates today. Well, I think he was a very complicated personality who, who allowed a lot of tangents to interfere with a straight line of thought and, uh, and uh, complicate the issues. And I think as an artist, like one of your, 
one, one of your obligations is simplicity, and another obligation is to complicate the issues. Is there attachment or grief in the end product? What, oh, when the painting is all done, is it difficult to let it go? It's very easy. I really dislike my painting. Um, I have a feeling it's, it's the repository of my hopes and my fears. And my fear is always much greater than my hopes. So that I, I, I'm, I'm not really attached to my, my painting as an object. I'm, I'm attached to it only as it leads to the next painting. You know, that's very important is to, to be sure that you don't get stuck. You know, a lot of people get stuck on, on a whole lot of issues, a whole lot of things. They, uh, our lives is, is guided by, by habits and, and, and insufficiencies and things like that. Uh, and I think in art, uh, you have the possibility, if, and not only just the possibility, but the obligation to get beyond the insufficiencies and the habits. So that's very difficult. And, and, and to get, uh, I mean, like, you know, this Robert Motherwell thing where he says he has his picture proceeds by mistakes. I can totally agree with that because, um, like for example, if I start a picture and it's, it's too right in the first place, I have a feeling I've been denied my real um, intention, which is to go through my paces, you know, make it be become something difficult, something um, uh, special, which I get to know only through uh, pounding at it day after day. But then, of course, when it's done, then it's done, you know, it's no longer very interesting. Then, then the art dealers come along and make it interesting again. <laughs> A lot, yeah. a lot, yeah. I, I, early this summer, somehow or other, my wife had been in the hospital and uh, I always, every time I come here, I come here with the false expectation of starting life afresh. You know, being a baby and being born for anew. And then, so I have all these empty canvases and I somehow have to do something on them. And in the beginning, one never knows quite what. So, so the first few weeks, I'm always very depressed. You know, and then finally, after a while, you, you get tired of being depressed and you start doing some real work. And then you feel better. But it's not, it's not I mean, you know, pe people keep, keep, keep saying to me, oh, you're so lucky. You're doing something that gives great pleasure. And I say, mm, maybe, sometimes, <laughs> you know, intermittently it gives pleasure. Especially if you see, uh, you know, you're painting hung in a wonderful place. Um, uh, then, then it gives pleasure, you know. Like I was just the other day, I was in, in somebody's house here in Brattleboro, Mr. and Mrs. Richards, and they just bought a painting of mine. And they hung it in such a nice place. So I all of a sudden looked at it and it seemed to be somebody else's work. <laughs> you know? And I was very pleased with that, you know, because one always wants to get beyond the self. I gave a, I gave a lecture in front of the um, American Association of Psychiatrists because my neighbor up here in West Brattleboro it's Dr. Sachs, who was the president of, of that association for, for that year. And he, um, um, he invited me to give this lecture, which, which was called um, Artistic Inspiration, um, Sentiment, Sentimentality, or Neither of the Above. So, so of course, I meant neither, neither of the above. And, uh, uh, at, and then, then I had, uh, a respondent, you know, they have these things made up in such a way that 
uh, you can um, you can sort of give a structure to things. And this was a Harvard professor in creativity. And the word creativity gives me the willies. You know, it's it's a word like it's a word like interesting. You know, what does interesting mean? You know, interesting to whom? What is what does it do to you? To it just means that you don't really know strongly enough what you're trying to say. You know, interesting. Uh, so creativity the same way. I mean, to talk about creativity, I mean, if you uh, start using um, uh, um, uh, 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 new kind of vinegar to make a salad dressing, you're being creative, you know. Well, I mean, you know, what does that have to do with God and his, his seven days, you know? <laughs> so, so that, uh, um, uh, I, 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 I think it's important not to make large claims, you know. Are there any painters that uh, influenced you or that you greatly admire? Thousands. Thousands. I mean, there's so many good painters, even around me now. There's many, many good painters. And, uh, I mean, there's many more bad painters, let's, let's face it, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, a, a, a lot of people uh, are very talented. And, and there, for example, there was a painter here who was teaching at Marlboro College named Frank Stout. Do people here know Frank? I'm sure some do. And, uh, and he was the most astonishingly facile and able draftsman and painter with a terrific sense of the sort of the ridiculousness of everything. You know, he managed to get that into his painting. Well, the poor guy had no, <clears throat> no way of getting in touch with the public. I mean, he never would have been invited to come stand here because he was not smooth enough. See, I'm a smoothie. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and Frank, he, 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 didn't have, he didn't have that. So, so now his paintings are all off the stretchers, piled in, in some place where it's damp. And, and these terrific paintings are all going to hell. Although he was exhibited in this museum a couple of times. You know, people tried to make something of it. But somehow or other, in addition to being an artist, you also have to have other, other talents. You've got to be able to get along with people. You've got to be organized. You've got to um, have a happy marriage. Otherwise, you spend all your time, you know, feeling bad about your wife and your life. And uh, all that, you've got to be, you know, in some, some kind of a strange way, quite healthy. And many people aren't, even though they have lots of talent. Like, frankly, it was just loaded with talent. But yet, there's maybe six people uh, around this area who, who, who bought his paintings, and prices were never high. Fortunately, he got a pension from Marlboro College. Not a very large one, because Marlboro isn't a very um, rich college, you know. But uh, they had enough sense to hire Frank to, to teach there. Yes? Oh, yeah, go ahead. We'll just do a couple more questions. I'm not an artist, I'm not an aspiring artist, but you talk to me and be curious about the following point. You start with freedom uh, a child has as an artist. And at the end, you are successful, you have a freedom uh, of art. In between, I assume there's got to be some acquisition of technique. And I was wondering how you saw that trajectory, what the relationship is, how you see the, the efficient way or the appropriate way or the best way to go from feature from the freedom of a child to freedom of could you hear in the back? The question is, if, uh, Wolf spoke about the desirability of eventually reaching a point where you're working sort of in the same spirit as a child who hasn't gone through a whole lot of training and, and 
and education and developing techniques. So how does that work? What, how does that trajectory work of having that childlike approach and then gaining technique and education and then ultimately wanting to get back to that childlike approach? Well, you have to start out with a capacity for enthusiasm. That's very important. And um, that, as, as a student, you're going to get enthusiastic about other art. You know, like, for example, I was terribly involved by Van Gogh when I was 20 years old. And I used to go around New York looking for stairs and, and lampposts. And at and, uh, uh, one point, I even picked up a bum and took him to my apartment and let him have a shower because, uh, you know, Van Gogh was sort of that kind of a guy. He would have uh, given a shower to a bum. And uh, um, so I, uh, and from there you go on to, um, to f feel that, that, that you really shouldn't be doing other people's art. And that gets to be a pressure. And you try to find out by being enthusiastic about a lot of different artists what your real direction wants to be. And you can't impose. I mean, there's, there's so many things you just simply can't impose upon your career and your life. You, things have to happen pretty naturally. And the trouble with, with um, uh, waiting for that is that you have to have uh, developed somewhere along the line a discipline of work. The discipline of work, and that comes, I think that comes from having like a, a drive, you know. And that takes you through those, those, those areas where nobody gives a damn about you as soon as you're out of art school. I mean, in art school, if you're any good, the teacher is going to give you some encouragement. And the other students will look at you with, with uh, a mixture of uh, awe and, and, and hate. And uh, um, so, so you're, um, uh, you, you get through that. But then when you're in the world at large, I mean, nobody cares less about anybody than the world cares about a, uh, uh, an art student fresh out of art school. Mm -hmm. So, so um, you've got to have a lot of drive and a lot of enthusiasm to allow you to get, get through those, those, those kind of uh, chaotic moments. Casey? Uh, yes, after many years of painting, sir, what motivates you to keep painting? Habit. <laughs> You know, I mean, I get up in the morning, I have my breakfast, and then I go to my studio. What am I going to do in my studio? I can't just sit there and pick my nose. <laughs> so I've got my paints there and, and, and unfinished canvases. One thing leads to another, and pretty soon I'm at work. So it's, 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 it's not, not difficult to, to um, continue day after day. And then, of course, another thing that happens that's very nice is if you become successful and you start making a little money and the dealers come around and you want to have something to show them and so forth. I mean, it's some, some very uh, low-grade impulses uh, are, are at work there to make you stay with, 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 on the job. Um, I, I, I don't claim I don't I don't claim great great spiritual drive to to make me do my work. Although although it's, I mean people say they look at my work and they find spirituality in it. I think gee thank God somebody thinks something about my work. You know <laughs> I don't know anything about it. You know I just I just work here as I said. You know. I think if anyone else has other questions, what you can do is buy a book or a box set of DVDs, and then while Wolf's signing them, you can ask him a, a question. Wolf, thank you so much. This is a pleasure.
थैंक यू